Welcome to this instructional video on the Michaelis-Mitten model of enzyme kinetics. So how do most enzymes work? Well, there's a kind of a unifying model of how this works. Uh, an enzyme will bind to a, will bind a substrate and it will form an enzyme substrate complex. And there is a rate constant that defines the formation of the enzyme substrate complex and a rate constant that describes the breakup of the enzyme substrate complex back to the free enzyme plus substrate. And then sometimes the enzyme substrate complex proceeds through a transition state onto the product and then back to the free enzyme. And so um, the rate constant that describes that is K3. And what we know is that K3 is also called K cat, called the catalytic rate constant. Now remember from Gen Chem that lowercase k's are rate constants, capital K's are equilibrium constants. So I try to draw this little cursive K is what I call it to be a lowercase k to, dis to distinguish it from a capital K. Well, if you take the Michaelis-Mitten model, uh, another thing that we know is that when you do a turnover, that is a substrate goes through the transition state through to the product, then you regenerate the enzyme. The enzyme can go back and do it again. And we call this turn over. So enzymes have multiple turnovers until the enzyme is degraded and then we're making new enzymes all the time anyway. Well if you if you want to really get into what's next you can go in the book and read more about it but I don't know over the years I've just decided to kind of cut to the chase as it is. If you make some assumptions and do some some um, some math you end up with an equation that describes the Michaelis-Mitten model. And so here it is. We're going to call this, wait for it, the Michaelis-Mitten equation. So that is the Michaelis-Mitten equation. And uh, this is something that you need to know. And we're going to go over the equation and we're going to do a, a, some graphing on it which you got that to look forward to. So wh what are the terms in the equation? Well the, the, the V is what we call the velocity. So V is velocity and then sometimes when you actually do this in the lab you actually measure what's called initial velocity. So sometimes you see V sub zero or you may just see V depending upon where you see it. Okay, This is the concentration or amount of product formed per time. And so this is the velocity of the reaction. Now, one thing you need to always pay attention to are the units on these terms. The units for velocity is going to be something along the lines of, again, it's a concentration or amount per time. So it could be micromoles per second. It could be millimolar in a concentration, millimolar per minute, or it might even be, I think I mentioned this in class, maybe molar per fortnight. So amount or concentration per unit time. That is, that's the units for uh, the velocity. Well, what is S in brackets? Well, you know brackets means concentration and so this is substrate concentration.
And uh, I'm not going to shock you here when I say the units are some type of concentration unit. Molar. Millimolar. Nanomolar. Something along those lines. Typically in enzyme biochemistry, we're, we stick with molar or some type of metric Pre, uh, derivative of molar like uh, milli, nanomolar, picomolar, something along those lines. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the equation and the velocity of an enzyme catalyzed reaction depends upon the substrate concentration. That's what the Michaelis-Minton equation tells you. And velocity and substrate concentration are variables. There's two constants in this equation as well, Vmax and Km. So let's take a look at what these mean. So if we go to the next page, I have kind of recreated here the Michaelis-Minton model. I've also written down once again the Michaelis-Minton equation. But let's go ahead and define Vmax and K sub M because those are two constants. in the equation. These are constants. And Vmax is a constant related to the enzyme. All right. And Vmax is the maximal catalytic rate. The maximal catalytic rate and it has units the same as velocity, some amount of concentration per time. That makes sense because Vmax is the maximal velocity. All right, so what is K sub M? Well, K sub M is what we call the Michaelis constant and it is the substrate concentration at one half the maximal velocity. So let's go over to the Michaelis-Minton plot. So you've got the Michaelis-Minton model You've got the Michaelis-Minton equation, and now we've got a Michaelis-Minton plot. And so over here, we're plotting initial velocity or velocity versus substrate concentration. And I don't, I don't think this plot is going to shock you when you're watching this video. We've kind of alluded to it in class that uh, this should be a hyperbolic curve. It is hyperbolic. Because you reach a level of saturation. At some point, at some point, all the active sites are filled with substrate being converted to product. And if you increase the substrate concentration even further, that doesn't affect the rate at all. And so if you remember what we've talked about in class, on this, this part of the curve here, is first order kinetics and this part of the curve here is what we call zero order kinetics. All right. Well, if you look at uh, the curve, when the curve actually levels off, 
then you know you have V max. The problem with this doing this Michaelis Mitten plot is that experimentally it's difficult to know when you've actually leveled off because really the data points are somewhere. Let me use a more contrasting color here. So you're really kind of curve fitting. And to be honest with you, sometimes it's hard to know when you've actually leveled off. And so, in fact, when you look at this, Vmax is somewhere above this line because the line has not technically leveled off yet. But when it does level off, it's going to get up to this Vmax line. And then you are going to extrapolate over and you are going to have Vmax right there. So this is the maximal velocity of the enzyme. That's Vmax, and it's read off the y-axis here, okay? How do you get Km? Well, you take one-half Vmax, you take one-half Vmax, which would be right there, okay? So Vmax over 2 is right there. You come over, extrapolate over, calm down, and then ladies and gentlemen, I want to make this a nice big blue dot right there. That's Km as read off the x of axis. So Vmax is a constant associated with the enzyme and Km is a constant associated with the substrate. And so what we know is, you know, Km is a capital K. It is a technically an equilibrium constant. And so what we need to do is make a, give you a couple of, of scenarios here. Here's what we know. If you look at the Michaelis-Smitten model, and here's an if statement. If K sub 3 is much less than K sub 2. That is the formation of the product. That rate constant, K3, is much, much less than K2, which is disruption of the enzyme substrate complex. Then what we know is that K Km is a dissociation constant. Km is a dissociation constant. And so this now, Km is a reflection of the affinity of a substrate for the enzyme. Now this condition doesn't always hold, and sometimes it never holds for some enzymes, but it's still a good, we're still going to use Km as a kind of a rough measure of the affinity of the substrate for the enzyme. And so based on our knowledge of what a dissociation constant is, as Km goes down, then the affinity between the enzyme and substrate should go up. And we know that the affinity between an enzyme and substrate needs to be uh, pretty mediocre. And so we don't want this to get carried away, right? We don't want substrates to bind too tightly. So we're going to see Km values usually in the millimolar range, which is somewhat mediocre binding. All right. Another thing before we leave this plot uh, to go to another plot is let me just say a little bit about K3. K3 is the we're going to call K cat the catalytic rate constant. It is called the turn turnover number. The number of times an enzyme uh, does its job per unit time. And so it has units of inverse time. So again, how many times does, a turn, does an enzyme do its job, turn over 
go from substrate to product in a given amount of time, that's going to be K3 or K cat. All right. Well, here's the deal. If you're actually trying to measure Vmax for an enzyme and Km for a substrate, the michaelis mitten plot is problematic because, again, as I said, you don't know when it really levels off. So what was developed is what we call the line weaver burke plot this is the line weaver burke plot here it is actually you take one over the michaelis mitten equation and do some lovely math okay it's rearrange and substitute and do all this kind of stuff then you end up with this equation right here which is again 1 over V max equals all of this. This is taking the michaelis mitten equation and basically inverting it and rearranging and solving for 1 over velocity. Okay? Now, what we know is that this plot or this equation actually follows the equation that you may be familiar with in some maybe some math class some uh, at some point this actually follows the equation for a straight line y equals m times x plus b i may have just sparked some really good memories for you all right the equation for a straight line so in this case one over v is y and look We've got 1 over V on the y-axis of our double reciprocal plot, which we're calling the line weaver burke plot because line weaver and Burke did this, okay? And then the slope of the line that we're going to see here is going to be Km over Vmax times X is 1 over substrate concentration. Hey, there's 1 over substrate concentration on the X-axis plus 1 over V max and 1 over V max is the Y intercept. B in this equation is the Y intercept. So what I just told you is if you do the double reciprocal plot you're going to get data points and you're going to do a best fit line through the data points. So again this is the best fit regression line through the data and the good thing about this now is that it's a linear plot so it's much easier to deal with much 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 easier to deal with okay so but how do we if, if you do this and you oh by the way you are going to do this in a kind of a take-home quiz that I'm going to give you on doing uh, line weaver burke plots um, how are you going to generate this plot? You will, you will be given a, a column of velocity data and substrate concentration. This is supposed to be a V. Let me do a little bit better job of that. So you're going to have data for velocity and data for substrate concentration. Well, you don't need that. You need... 1 over V and you need 1 over S. So you're going to have to invert the data to get a new set of numbers and you're going to plot 1 over V versus 1 over S with 1 over V being on the Y axis, 1 over S being on the X axis. And then if this goes well, you should get a linear line with slope Km over V max. Also, what we know is that the y-intercept right here equals 1 over v max. So if you know the y-intercept, and the equation for the straight line will give you the y-intercept, if you, you're going to do this on Excel, you're going to get the equation for the straight line. So it will give you the y-intercept you get 1 over V max and, sh and if you know 1 over V max all you have to do is invert it to get V max okay well look at this the x-intercept 
the x-intercept, let me write this a little bit better, equals minus 1 over km. Well, if you know the value for the x-intercept, and you know it equals minus 1 over km, can you solve for km? Yes, you can. So, a line river Burke plot, you take rate versus substrate concentration, or the velocity, V, and then you invert both columns to get 1 over V and 1 over S. You get a whole new set of data. You plot it. It should give you a linear relationship. You do a best fit line through that. The slope of that line is Km over V max. The Y intercept is 1 over V max, which, you, which from that you can find V max. The X intercept is minus 1 over Km, which is, if you know that number, you can calculate Km from that. So, this is the double reciprocal plot. This is how we uh, most of the time would calculate Vmax for an enzyme and Km for a substrate with that enzyme. And part of your homework assignment is going to be doing this for an enzyme without the presence of an inhibitor, which we'll talk about in class, uh, and then in the presence of a particular type of inhibitor, and we'll see how the line weaver burke plot, um, how, the, how this line will change with a particular oh, inhibitor. All right, so we know the Michaelis-Mitten model. We know the Michaelis-Mitten equation. We know the Michaelis-Mitten plot. And the Michaelis-Mitten plot has got some issues. So we reworked the data. And so that allows us to do a line weaver burke plot, which is a linear relationship and much easier to work with. By the way, let me just throw this out here in case anybody actually listens to this video or watches this video. How do you calculate the x-intercept? Well, you have, the, you have the equation for the best fit line. If you have the equation for the best fit line, the x-intercept is the x value when y equals 0. So set y equal to 0, solve for x. The computer Excel is going to give you the slope and the y-intercept values. So I guess what I'm telling you is uh, the x-intercept if you do 0 equals m times x plus b, can you solve for x? In this case, x will be the x-intercept. Well, here we go. Uh, now, you've got what? Minus b equals m times x. So minus b over m equals x. Let me write this a little bit better. And so this will be the x-intercept. It is the value of x when y equals 0. All right. Well, what else we got to say about this? Well, this next page uh, tells, shows us one example of the enzyme hexokinase. And then hexokinase has um, two substrates. It has ATP as, let's just call that substrate number one. And then substrate number two can be one of two things. It can be glucose or it can be fructose. So uh, hexokinase will always have ATP as a substrate, and then it can have glucose or fructose. And again, I'm just giving you some Km values. And you shouldn't be shocked that Km concentration uh, has units of concentration. Km is the substrate concentration at 1 half Vmax. And so uh, the Km for ATP with hexokinase is 0.4 millimolar. Again, millimolar is what we would have expected. And then if we look at glucose and fructose, then you see that those, the second substrate 
uh, there's some quite a bit of difference in the KM values. And since KM for glucose is lower, then I think we could say glucose is probably the preferred substrate number two. And what this is suggesting to us uh, is that glucose binds a little bit tighter than fructose, although they're both, as we would say, hanging on loosely. And so I guess I'll bring this up, not for you to memorize this, but to say, okay, you have an enzyme. Every substrate with every enzyme has some type of KM value, and we're going to roughly use that as a measure of the affinity of the substrate for the enzyme. Now I've given you the structure of glucose and fructose down here, and I guess I want you to think about why would the KM values for these two sugars be different? That is, why would they have different affinities for the enzyme hexokinase? Well, let's just say glucose is G. Let's abbreviate that G. And let's abbreviate fructose F. Uh, I think if you look at the two molecules, I think the answer of why they have different affinities for hexokinase in the active site of hexokinase, uh, somewhat clear maybe. If the main the main difference, not the surely not the only difference. Well, actually, this is the difference right here. This is in glucose, and by the way, you you will come to understand and learn and appreciate and love that glucose is what we call an aldose and fructose is what we're going to call a ketose because glucose is an aldehyde fructose is a ketone well the difference between these two molecules are right here okay so here's what we know These two molecules have different hydrogen bond donor acceptor patterns. You can see that. You can kind of see that in the in the two pink boxes that they have different hydrogen bond donor acceptor patterns. Okay, so since its KM is lower, glucose likely makes more hydrogen bonds. in the active site of hexo kinase. Therefore, it has a somewhat lower KM value. That means it binds a little bit tighter, although don't get carried away, okay? Uh, and so it, it probably is a preferred substrate within the cell versus fructose. So why am I bringing this up? KM is a very important constant for substrates with particular enzymes. You wouldn't say the KM for hexokinase is blah blah. That doesn't make any sense at all. You could say the KM of glucose with hexokinase is 0.05 millimolar. There we go. I can get that. So we're going to use KM uh, values as we go along and it's going to be an important constant for certain substrates with enzymes and you shouldn't be surprised that different substrates for the same enzyme have different KM values and this was a great explanation of this glucose versus fructose they both can be the second substrate for hexokinase but they have different KMs and again that KM is finely tuned to match the biological role of hexokinase, which its main role is to phosphorylate glucose, not fructose. Okay? All right. So,
what else do we need to do here? Well, let's look at a, a two tables full of data. Whoa, here we go. So, what about table 6-7? There's nothing to memorize in any of these two tables. Okay? Uh, remember, K sub cat, if we, let me remind you of the Michaela Smitten model here. E plus S is in equilibrium with ES. Sometimes E sub S breaks or proceeds to go ahead and go through the transition state to make the product. This is K sub cat right here. And this is the K sub cat that they are using in this table. Again, the units are per second, and I told you before, this, the, the units for kcat has to be some type of inverse time. So this just kind of tells us how good of an enzyme do we have here. Look at this. Look at this. Let me, let me go ahead and define this again, because I think that's important. K sub cat, the catalytic rate constant this will be for a particular enzyme, okay? And we also call this turnover number. All right, well, look at this. Catalase, oh. it's an enzyme that turns over 40 million times per second. That is a very high turnover number. Wow. And then you've got beta-lactamase in there about 2,000 times per second. And then you've got poro-rec-A protein that turns over 0.5 times per second. It takes two seconds for this enzyme to do one turnover. And so the take-home message here, I guess, is twofold. Number one, and this is probably obvious, enzymes do not all have the same turnover number. Well, let me just say K sub cat. Enzymes do not all have the same turnover number. Guess what? That should make perfect sense because the turnover number for an enzyme is finely tuned to its biological role. We need catalase to be a very good enzyme. We need it to be fantastic because catalase protects us from hydrogen peroxide, a very dangerous endogenous molecule. We need it to be the champion. We need it to be great. Rec A, for reasons I'm not going to get into in this video, Rec A needs to be a fairly lousy enzyme. Sorry, Rec A, but you are not that great. And we need you to be not that great because that is your biological role. And so I guess, number one, enzymes do not all have the, the uh, same turnover number or same K cat. And then number two, some enzymes I guess I'm going to be kind here are, got, are lousy. That's fine. That's They need to be kind of a lousy enzyme. They need to be kind of well, less than mediocre. Okay, because that's actually their job. What if it was your job to suck at your job? Well, that's your job to suck at it, okay? And that's what Rec A does. All right. Wow. What's about table 6-8? Well, you can, you can calculate for every enzyme with a particular substrate, you can calculate KCAT over KM. And this is where I'm taking, taking issue with this table. Uh, this, I don't like this right here. This should be K cat because it's a rate constant that looks like a capital K to me sorry I'm just being kind of what I do kind of just being particular okay so here's the deal of uh, K cat over KM is called the specificity 
constant. And it's a second order rate constant. Okay, so K cat divided by KM is called the specificity constant. And it has to have and it has to have these type of units per concentration per time. So in this in this table it's per molar per second. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a second order rate constant. Okay? And so I guess what we're looking at here is we are looking at these numbers here. And so for for some enzymes, uh, if this um if this number KCAT divided by KM for a particular substrate, um, if it's around 10 to the, oh, here it is right here. Look at this. Let me just use what they've given us. 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 9th per molar per second, we call this diffusion controlled limit. That is the rate limiting step for this enzyme. It's just the encounter of the enzyme and substrate. That's the, that, ladies and gentlemen, that's the slowest part of the whole process. The slowest part is enzyme, the enzyme finding a substrate and binding it. That's the slowest part, not the other part of the mechanism of it actually going to the product. That's why it's called diffusion controlled limit. And so these are acetylcholine esterase. Carbonic anhydrase. Hey, we've already talked about carbonic anhydrase. You may have talked about acetylcholine esterase in another class. These are some good enzymes. And there's catalase also has a high specificity constant. These enzymes have evolved to do a very important job. And so they are, I guess, some of the most, if, if you want to call it the most efficient enzymes that we have, that is, once the enzyme binds the substrate, that's the, that's the slowest step. That's the slowest step. And what governs the encounter of an enzyme and substrate? Well, there's a, there's a diffusion limit, how fast they can encounter one another. The rest of it is much, much faster. The, the rest of the process is much faster. I'm not going to do too much with this, but you need to know what KCAT is, obviously. You know what KM is. Then you can divide the two and get what we call the specificity constant. And if it's around 10 to the 8th or 10 to the 9th, then you know that, wow, this is a, this is a highly evolved enzyme to do its job very well because the slowest part of the whole process is just the enzyme encountering the substrate. All right, what else do we have? Let's do one more thing here before we end this video. Um, you know, some enzymes have multiple substrates. And so, you know, you're going to get two products formed. But how that happens can vary. So let's just, let me just briefly go over these, this multiple substrate scenarios, let's say. Well, the, the first is what we call uh, random order. So here's random order right here. Uh, that means that there's two substrates now. Okay, there's two substrates. By the way, let me, let me do this. Let me define ternary complex. Ternary complex is when you have an enzyme and you have substrate one and you have substrate two all together in one complex. There's three molecules associated together. The enzyme, substrate one, and substrate two. They're there at the same time. And then there's going to, they're going to go through a transition state and go to the two products. That's how enzymes work, right? So with random order, what I'm telling you is substrate one can bind first or substrate two can bind first. It doesn't matter because in either route, you get the same ternary complex. And then we go through the transition state and you proceed toward the enzyme and the two products. That's random order. 
The other example here under, I guess, heading A, where we form a ternary complex, is ordered. Enzyme binds substrate 1, and then you form an enzyme substrate 1 complex, and only after substrate 1 is bound can substrate number 2 bind. And when that happens, here we go. This is the ternary complex. And then you proceed to the two products of, and the enzyme. But let's think about this. This is a great test question. Why can't S2 bind to the free enzyme? And when I say free enzyme, I'm talking about this guy right here. Look at this. Why can't S2 bind the free enzyme? Well, it doesn't have a binding site because the binding site for S2 is only formed after substrate 1 binds the enzyme. That's how the enzyme controls the order of binding. And then, and so this is uh, one example of this. One example of this is called induced fit. And you have some supplementary notes on the enzyme hexokinase. Hexokinase forms a ternary complex, but there's ordered binding. And glucose binds first. And when glucose binds hexokinase, there's a conformational change that allows ATP to bind next. And then you go through a ternary complex. All right. Uh, the last example is a bit exotic. I'm not going to go too much into this. Uh, I'll just say that B here, you actually never form a ternary complex, but you still form two products. I'm not going to ask you about this one here. I guess I could put a big, a big X here. I'm not going to ask you about this one. But the random and the ordered binding, I think, is important for you to know. All right. So this hadn't been, you know, I guess it hadn't been complete and utter torture, possibly. But this is enzyme kinetics. And we need to understand what is the Michaela-Smitten model of kinetics. What is the Michaela-Smitten equation? And what is the Michaela-Smitten plot? And I'm getting toward the end of the, of the video, and my dog's going crazy. Hang on a second. All right. We've got our two, Michaela Smitten plot, Line Weaver Burke plot. We know about Vmax. We know about Km. We know about the catalytic rate constant. And so all of this is just really important information to really understand how enzymes work. What we're going to do moving forward is we're going to talk about these plots again, but we're going to talk about what if we have an enzyme inhibitor. And so enzyme inhibition, blocking the activity of enzymes, is going to be our next kind of major uh, topic as we move forward. So let's end this. Thanks for watching and listening.